Ayugo is a great I, twin. Um, yeah, so for our uh, second talk today, we have uh, uh, Ugo Dallago, who is a professor at the uh, University of Bologna. And uh, he has done a lot of work in many areas. Uh, he is uh, very well known for his work on implicit computational complexity. But in the last uh, few years, he has been focusing uh, on uh, understanding uh, the metric aspect of uh, program equivalence. And this is uh, what he will uh, present at the school. Hugo, the floor is here. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to, to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to um, give this course at the Oregon Programming Language uh, Summer School. Uh, it, it is actually kind of a dream uh, which uh, comes true for me. Um, and uh, yes, Marco is correct. Uh, what I'm going to talk about in this course uh, are the, uh, let me say, the, the, how you can kind of uh, uh, gently and easily drift from a program equivalences to program metrics. Uh, in doing so, I want to present program equivalences in a slightly non-standard way, making heavy use of so-called relational calculus. Uh, this way, um, notions can be presented uh, in a quite elegant, simple, and compact way, um, highlighting the, uh, uh, let's say, the most important aspects of program equivalence. And on the other hand, uh, um, presenting program equivalences this way uh, also allows you to um, easily and gently uh, generalize uh, program equivalences into notions of metrics and of differentials, as we will see at the end of the, of the course, if time permits. Okay, wonderful. So um, the starting point uh, is uh, the observation that uh, um, we all always want to be compositional <laughs> in programming language theory. And uh, we are often faced uh, um, with uh, uh, situations uh, in which, uh, by the way, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, you can, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, ask, uh, ask questions in the chat. They will be collected by Thomas uh, Drab. And uh, from time to time, I will ask Thomas to um, kind of, you know, collect the questions and uh, 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 so that they, uh, I can take them. Um, and so please, uh, uh, you know, use this opportunity to uh, ask whatever you find unclear in what I'm going to say. Okay, sorry. So I was, I was saying that the compositionality is something we always aim uh, for in programming languages. Uh, and what I mean is that uh, um, very often we, are, we deal with very complicated programs um, which interact very heavily uh, internally, namely they are maybe uh, uh, partitioned into subsystems, into subprograms, into libraries, and these libraries and uh, or, or, or classes or whatever they uh, heavily interact with each other in complicated ways. Uh, making the overall program or system, uh, um, you know, hard to reason about at the global level. But anyway, very often <laughs> you want to maybe pick one of these components, maybe a little one, uh, throw it away and uh, replace it with another one. Maybe you want to replace um, a little program A inside your overall system the function A inside your overall system uh, because it's too, exp uh, it's, the, its complexity is too high. So it, it causes kind of a, a problems in terms of performance uh, uh, in the overall system. And you want to replace it with B uh, because, uh, you know, B is more, is more efficient, um, takes less time or less space uh, to do its job. But, you know, you want to do it uh, um, typically when uh, you are sure that A and B are somehow in relation. Um, you would like, for example, to replace A with B only when A is equivalent to B. 
So when A has the same behavior as B. And indeed, um, this gives, fly, gives rise, uh, as we probably all know, to notion of program equivalence, which is so pervasive. And so, I have to say, uh, you know, uh, you can find it in all different aspects of programming language uh, theory, also in verification, compiler constructions that we are going to, to see. But then, you know, what's the appropriate notion of program equivalence? That is not just one, that's the point. There are many. And uh, different definitions of program equivalence uh, uh, suit the different needs. We could like uh, maybe to adapt two programs to be equivalent, uh, well, if they have the same denotation and semantics, or whether if they um, uh, behave the same uh, when seen uh, as rapidly transition systems, if they are bisimilar, um, if they are logically related, if you, for example, put yourself in a, uh, an higher order uh, programming language. And I'm sure um, Bob Harper has already told you something about it last week. So when, first of all, a notion of program equivalence is uh, acceptable and when is it good enough for us? You would first of all, um, you would first of all like to be sure that whenever you substitute A for B, even if A and B are very different syntactically, the, the, the behavior of the overall system does not change. And you know, as I said, uh, uh, program equivalences uh, uh, are pervasive. By the way, it's not uh, true that the only notion of relation between programs, which is interesting, is a notion of equivalence. Uh, absolutely not. Also, program preorders are quite um, quite relevant. Uh, for example. In the previous slide here, you could take A as a specification rather than as a proper program, and you would like uh, to replace it uh, uh, inside the um, uh, partially unspecified uh, uh, system with an actual implementation B. And in this sense, you don't require this uh, implementation B to be perfectly equivalent to the specification, but you want to kind of uh, impose that it is a refinement of the specification A. So underlying the relation between A and B. You don't have a, an equivalence, but rather a preorder. You can find, for example, uh, program equivalences and preorders in whenever you justify compiler optimizations, you want the optimized code to be equivalent to the original one. Maybe more efficient, uh, but equivalent in terms of the overall behavior. As I said, also program verification can be seen as a form of uh, um, relational reasoning about uh, programs when you take the specification um, as uh, uh, one ideal program and uh, the actual implementation uh, as a more complete program. Also program transformations, of course. Um, also in cryptographic reasoning, there are notions uh, like uh, computational distinguishability, which, are, which can be seen as notions of program equivalences um, when uh, you know, spelled out uh, for programs rather than for distributions. Also non-interference, if you know a little bit about it, it can be formulated as a um, form of program equivalence uh, where um, the, uh, what matters are the behavior of the two systems uh, uh, when uh, the high level inputs change while the low level inputs change. Very good. So, um, I said many notions of program equivalence are available from the literature. I already mentioned some of them, computational, contextual, uh, CIU, um, co-inductive ways of uh, comparing programs, trace-based uh, notions of um, equivalence for programs. And uh, there is no you know, clear answer to the question of whether one of them is the best. <laughs> okay, there are, on the other hand, uh, um, uh, Precise answers as for whether any of these notions is, can be considered as the canonical one. And uh, we will talk about that maybe today, oh, I'm sure, actually, today. There are many keywords probably you heard about. For example, uh, notion for the notion of substitutivity for program equivalences, full abstraction, 
And then uh, applicative by similarity, one particular notion of program equivalence you have uh, heard about for textual uh, equivalent, observational equivalent, uh, actually a synonym. Um, compatibility, uh, yeah, canonical ways of uh, extending notion of program equivalence, like the open extension, the substitutive extension. These are all keywords we will talk about. And uh, we will try to make uh, their status clear in such a way that, uh, you know, the kind of aura of uh, magic that some of them <laughs> have uh, in the PF uh, literature is kind of clarified uh, uh, reasonably well, I would say. Good. Uh, let's take a look at some examples. So uh, this is like a very simple example. I'm considering two higher order programs. Uh, the first one, one, uh, here takes an input a natural number x and a function from natural numbers to natural numbers, for example, and returns the value of the function when fed with x plus zero. And then, of course, uh, you know, this plus zero can be easily replaced with just uh, nothing because, uh, of course, adding zero to a natural number leaves the uh, natural number unchanged. And uh, indeed, in most the notions uh, of uh, program equivalence, these two programs are considered in, in, indistinguishable. Um, and uh, you know, inside uh, uh, your program, you can uh, very often, almost in all uh, uh, notions of program equivalence, uh, uh, apply some simple arithmetic laws. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I can already tell you that uh, in, there are very kind of fine-grained notion of program equivalence for which these two programs are not considered equivalent. So if you take some notions of open by simulation or if you like uh, um, BERM tree equivalence, well, you are not really allowed to use arithmetic whenever you want. Uh, and indeed, uh, even if uh, it seems very, very trivial that these two programs should be considered equivalent, well, this is not always the case. Depends. Uh, then, you know, if you take these two pair, these other pair of programs uh, um, in which you just uh, evaluate uh, an expression A and its value is fed to the, value, to the function F, um, uh, you see on the right hand side, uh, well, it's the same as evaluating also Y um, because it's not used, the evaluation of B is not used. And again, uh, it seems quite um, easy to realize that this uh, equivalence should be considered uh, valid. Indeed, uh, in many cases, uh, these two programs are equivalent. Well, the point is that maybe this expression B could be producing some side effects. And in this case, well, of course, the two, the two um, uh, programs are not equivalent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if they are, this can be seen uh, uh, as uh, some kind of that code elimination, and which is available in, the, in for example, in purely functional programming. And go, going to uh, uh, another example, uh, well, um, you can, for example, take the program on the left hand side, which is just a form of addition, formulating some kind of monadic style. Um, and you can kind of take a, a, a different version of it, modulo some carrying the operator, in which you have this uh, auxiliary, uh, auxiliary function bind, uh, which uh, uh, takes an input, a function which adds uh, um, one of the two arguments to the other. And again, it seems that they are equivalent. And uh, this is, uh, if you like, a form of code in line. Downsides. There are downsides to the notion of uh, program equivalence per se. Why? Uh, first of all, program equivalences can be seen as way of uh, reasoning about the programs, uh, about pair of programs, uh, uh, getting an outcome about uh, the comparison about the two programs. And seeing uh, uh, program equivalences this way um, means uh, uh, considering uh, uh, just Boolean outcomes. Why? Because whenever you compare two programs, the only possible outcomes are either zero or one. Better, better, 
the program is the two programs are not equivalent or they are equivalent. There is nothing else. In particular, um, if the two programs are not equivalent, well, it's the end of the story. Okay. So all the possible pairs of programs uh, which are not equivalent uh, are treated the same in program equivalence, despite uh, it being like a universally accepted uh, uh, form of reasoning for programming language. Um, in practice, however, there are many pairs of programs which actually behave very, very similarly, although they cannot be considered as uh, equivalent. And uh, sometimes these programs are, as you will see soon, they are used in contexts like uh, the ones uh, um, I mentioned before, namely um, uh, program transformations, compiler optimizations. Uh, this is getting more and more, uh, uh, this is getting more and more common. So why not replacing the set here? So the co-domain of our kind of comparison uh, operator, a uh, richer set, maybe a numerical set, in particular a, a set with uh, more elements or with a richer structure, why not? Uh, this way you would kind of uh, be able to um, uh, evaluate the uh, uh, similarities uh, and differences between programs in a more informative way. And there is also another point about uh, program equivalence, which was kind of implicit in what I was saying, uh, and which is uh, uh, taken more or less for granted in the in most of the literature, which is like the independence on the context. So two equivalence, uh, equivalent programs uh, are very often required uh, um, to behave the same in all possible contexts. We were saying exactly the, uh, uh, this uh, in the first slide. So whenever A and B are equivalent, well, they behave the same independently on the context to see the rest of the system in which they are based. Um, and often, you know, the, the relation you have here is the same as the relation you have here. And indeed, this is nothing more than the definition of what a congruence relation is if you couple it with the requirement of it being an equivalence relation. Um, the point is that, you know, <laughs> it is safe to transform A to B in a context C for which uh, the discrepancies between A and B are not visible. For example, C, well, it simply does not feed the, the whole, either A or B, with uh, um, one of those values for which A and B behave differently. And so, well, this information is simply not there in, in programming equivalence. And so it is kind of natural to think about uh, uh, how to overcome this uh, second uh, uh, problem, let's say. For example, you know, even if you take classic examples, very old examples from uh, numerical uh, analysis, from numerical computation, well, uh, you can already see what I mean. Because if you take the integral of f between a and b as the specification of what you want to do, and you take like one of the many possible ways of uh, um, computing this integral um, numerically, so by subdividing the interval between uh, a and b in n little subintervals, and then, uh, well, taking uh, uh, the value of x uh, um, well in the middle of these intervals uh, and then using the usual Riemann style um, uh, uh, integral taking the usual Riemann style integral but only in an approximate sense but if you do so you soon realize that uh, the one on the right is not um, a refinement of the specification of the left because it, it, it introduces some error Okay, some approximation error. So the two are not uh, in relation the way we usually uh, put programs in relation, program and specifications in relation in program semantics. And indeed, these are not equivalent. 
even if the differences in outputs uh, uh, in the outputs are just uh, the numerical errors. So you would like to kind of keep them into account when you compare them. And uh, let's go even, you know, uh, to an example which is even uh, uh, more problematic from this point of view. Suppose, for example, you want to replace uh, you know, a subroutine in your program which computes the sine trigonometric function with another subroutine which just computed the, the identity. And uh, the first question is does it make sense? Uh, actually, the two functions computed by A and B, e, e, interpret them as just functions between real numbers. They are pretty different. They are very different, actually. Uh, and in fact, uh, the two programs are not equivalent in any uh, possible uh, meaning of the word. Um, moreover, and this is not the same thing as what we have just seen with the integral. The outputs are not just close to each other. They, are, they can be arbitrarily far away. Particularly if you take an x, uh, which is big enough here, or an x, which is uh, big enough, but on the other side of the diagram, well, uh, sign and the identity are very far away. On the other hand, if the context, the feed, um, uh, a or B with an input which is very close to zero. Well, the two, we all know, <laughs> they behave very similarly. Not only their value is the same, but their derivative is the same. So indeed, this is like a, a toy example of what people call a, an approximate program transformation. So a program transformation uh, which does not respect the program behavior, which, uh, uh, and this is the case, allows you to replace a program with a much more efficient one, uh, and which only makes sense, however, if the context, uh, so if the environment feed the whole with some specific inputs. But in this case, inputs very close to zero. Further examples. Um, this uh, 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 function on the left is that the inverse uh, square root of x. And the function on the right here is just a linear function silly, uh, apparently innocuous linear function. Actually, this is a, a program transformation which is similar to the previous one, but contrary to the um, previous one, it is actually used. I took it from the literature on approximate program transformations. And indeed, it is valid only if the context of the whole with a, a, a value for, of x, which is very close to this integral. Okay, is it like, the only thing to ask to the context, well, no. You all also want the context uh, not to be able to um, kind of uh, uh, amplify the differences between the output of, of A and the output of B. Okay. So if you want to replace A with B, well, you need to be very careful and uh, um, about what the context feed the um, whole with and what the uh, context does with the output received from home. Okay, and um, these are advanced examples. I don't think we will be able to treat the techniques able to justify them, um, but just to you know stimulate your curiosity, that is a technique called the loop perforation, for example, in which you replace a for loop uh, with uh, um, uh, another for loop in which uh, uh, one every k iterations is taken instead of um, uh, all iterations like in the original program. So you skip uh, k minus one uh, iterations uh, every time. And this is quite a, an improvement in terms of performance, of course. Uh, when the um, let's say the uh, body of the for loop, this is uh, the one you see here, of course, is, this is not the case, but when the body of the loop uh, is kind of not so sensitive to uh, changes, when in particular, when you do in consecutive iterations of the for loop uh, here on the right left is more or less uh, uh, similar, okay, 
then skipping some uh, iterations, well, it makes could make sense. And indeed, new perforation, although it's it's very fragile as a program perforation, it can be used and it is used. And this is another example of a, um, a, a way of computing the fast inverse square root. Again, um, this is. Uh, uh, this is like a function which only involves uh, um, arithmetical operations. There is nothing like the square root, uh, an, act an explicit uh, square root computation here. Uh, what you get is uh, not uh, always uh, so close to the actual uh, inverse square root, but it approximates it quite nicely. And indeed, uh, um, you know, that's the way the inverse square root was computed in an old title game from the, from the 90s that some of you might know. Okay. So, um, okay. Um, let me go on. Maybe I, I see there are many questions, but I, I think I will take all of them at the end of these slides because uh, uh, they will soon be over. Uh, so, a paradigm shift is needed here and the uh, um, the paradigm shift, uh, what I mean by paradigm shift is that, uh, well, differences should become kind of uh, uh, the, the meaning of programs. Normally, what you focus on program identities, on pro the program meaning, and the identity of a program um, just allows you to um, uh, dub whether two programs are equivalent, whether they behave the same, while differences are generally not taken into account. They should become part of the meaning of the programs, if you like, or they, would, they should become uh, part of your semantic frameworks. Uh, um, if you want to be able to justify the program transformation we have just seen. The other, on the other hand, the context uh, matters. Uh, in particular, whenever you require your program transformation to work on all context, something is lost. And so uh, rather than uh, who's like uh, taking the, the situation, the scenario we had at the beginning of the of this lecture, in which uh, you substituted a for e for b for all in any possible context, see if a and b are equivalent. We should kind of switch to a different uh, scenario in which a and b are put at a certain distance, delta, which can be for the moment can be anything, <laughs> and C is kind of uh, uh, dubbed as being sensitive to changes according to epsilon. For the moment, it can be anything. And uh, when you plug C with A and C with B, you get two overall systems which are at a certain distance, which can be computed from delta and epsilon. So the circle, the circle, circle here, again, it can be anything. Could be the sum, <laughs> it could be uh, the, a logical operation, it can be even more than that. And uh, for example, you could think about justifying this way the program transformation between sine trigonometric function and identity uh, by saying that uh, the way the context is uh, sensitive to changes is captured by just one number which captures the fact itself that the context feeds the value, the, sorry, the whole with a value close to zero. And, but the distance between A and B is not anymore a Boolean. It's not even one single numerical value, but it is a function. A function depending on the actual argument, which tells you how far the, uh, uh, outputs of the two programs could be. And um, this could, in this case, be the difference between y and si the sign of y. Maybe you can take the uh, absolute value of, of, of all this. But what is crucial here is that from these two guys, from epsilon and delta, by just applying one to the other, you can get that uh, when the context behaves right way, um, but when it is benign, well, uh, you get a 
distance between C A and C B, uh, which is small. Okay. So this is something that we will probably see maybe at the very end of the course. So there is a long way to go there. We want to first of all understand what um, um, program equivalence is properly, what the, what the what a program metric is properly, and then we can take a look at the issue. And uh, yes, I want to briefly mention that there is a fundamental tension going on here. There is a fundamental tension because uh, well, there are many ways of defining uh, epsilon delta, right? You could define epsilon delta whenever you like. For example, in program equivalences proper, delta is just a Boolean value, and epsilon, well, it's nothing. You don't need it. <laughs> All contexts uh, are sensitive to changes uh, the same way. Uh, whenever there is a, uh, a change in, in the whole, they notice it in a sense. But you can take delta and epsilon as being real numbers, and this is what happens in program metrics. But for example, program metrics would not allow you to justify the, the distance between sign and uh, uh, the identity because uh, the uh, program metric tells you that two programs are far away. Um, from each other uh, based on a single uh, real number. Okay. And how could you capture the fact that X, say the identity and sign are well, uh, far away uh, just when the input is equal to zero? You need something more. So you have a kind of a fundamental tension between ways of computing epsilon and uh, delta, which are effective but not expressive. Namely, uh, they cannot account for um, the kind of examples we show, even if uh, computing the composition of delta and epsilon is easy, like in program metrics. And you know, on the other hand, you can think about silly way of comparing programs in which the difference between A and B is just a pair A, B, A, B. Of course, it doesn't make any sense. Why? It doesn't make any sense because this is not effective. Computing the, uh, the interaction between, between epsilon and delta, well, it is as hard as actually running A in the context C and running B in the context C. So it's not um, uh, effective uh, at all. So, but the, what I want to say is that there is kind of a spectrum, right? Um, there are notions of a, a program uh, distance of uh, uh, program differences um, which cannot be used to capture the kind of examples we have just seen, uh, but we, which are, are very acceptable as for uh, how you can compose uh, uh, delta and epsilon. And there are uh, notions of program pair uh, distances, which are absolutely not effective. Uh, I would not even consider them, but they show you that there is some something to be discovered as far as expressiveness is concerned. And so the real question is whether there is something here between them. This is, by the way, um, a topic of a research project in which I'm involved. Okay, I think now. Um, I would take the questions because the last two slides are about uh, uh, a plan for the course and uh, the logistics of the course. So I think this is a good way. A good uh, moment. I <laughs> yes, I think there's an interesting question if uh, delta composed with epsilon should be uh, the same kind of uh, as delta as a program distance on the previous slide. Uh, yes, it's a, this is a quite interesting question. So, uh, in particular, you know, uh, delta um, is something which is uh, just uniform. The type of delta is the type of delta is something which is uniform for all possible programs. Uh, delta should be, should be part of the same set. Then the, the answer to the question should, uh, would be yes, of course. <laughs> Because after composing uh, delta and epsilon, you get a distance between the, over, the two overall systems. And you would like to be able to use this distance to plug uh, the two overall systems in, even in, into a, a possibly even a more complicated environment. 
On the other hand, there are notions of program distance uh, in which uh, the type of delta is kind of very much related to the type of the programs, of the, of the programs you, you compare. And in this case, the, um, um, the kind of uh, composition you get uh, between delta and epsilon is of a different type, can be of a different type. Uh, and there's uh, other question and discussion is following. Uh, what are the cases when we would like uh, to have these functions continuous depending on context? Uh, is well, there? <laughs> of course, you know. In uh, in uh, if you if you impose uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know when they. Uh, uh, these metrics are continuous with respect to the context. Uh, uh, well, you are you are already restricting the scope of your, what you want to do, and uh, um, you know if uh, the um, little changes in the context uh, always produces little change uh, in the um, uh, overall uh, differences. Well, it's already a very good like a very good situation, and but this is not always the case. Unfortunately, there are like situations in which uh, uh, discontinuity does not hold. Mm -hmm. This is more or less, this is quite related actually to what I'm going to talk about in the second part of the of this course uh, when uh, the topic will be program metrics. There, well, you will see that there is some form of continuity, but we need to restrict the language if we want to do so. Mm -hmm. Then I'm, I'm taking a look at myself. Uh, I don't see more at the moment. I yes, think. I don't think uh, there is like a. Uh, yes, yeah, I don't see any. They uh, so somebody has guessed correctly what uh, uh, this inverse uh, root approximation algorithm. Very good, yeah, wonderful. So let me go on with uh, the last um, two slides, uh, which are about the, the, uh, the plan for this course and the logistics. So uh, what I'm going to tell you about is a unifying viewpoint of an equivalences metrics and if time permits about uh, these differentials in higher order languages. So the uh, kind of programming languages we will consider are higher order. Uh, the higher order ones. So I've chosen, um, uh, together with Francesco Cavazzo, who, by the way, helped me a lot in preparing uh, uh, all this, I've chosen to follow uh, as much as possible um, the kind of the notation and language uh, Bob Arthur used in the first part of this uh, uh, summer school so that uh, you can kind of reduce what you have learned uh, um, last week. So we will. Uh, Work with the simply type lambda calculus in a formulation based very closely related to the one Bob used and to calculus with recursive types um, that you can find in the uh, in Bob's book. I, I, I hope he talked about it the last week, at uh, least a little bit. But we also consider something that probably uh, didn't talk about last week, which is uh, uh, lambda calculus for probabilistic computation. This is called, this is called lambda PR. And for each of them, we will first uh, take a look at the uh, notions of contextual, denotational, logical, and applicative equivalences. Uh, for logical, what I mean are the logical relations. Uh, deliberately, we will not uh, define them on recursive types, even if this is possible. This is uh, absolutely possible. But it requires something called step indexing. and. Uh, uh, while uh, uh, in presence of recursive types, there is another way to compare programs for the applicative by similarity, which is very natural, being defined co-inductively rather than inductively, and this way taming implicitly the infinitary aspects of the calculus coming from the presence of recursive types. And for uh, program for uh, probabilistic uh, computation, we could see that uh, logical and applicative. Uh, Notions of equivalence can be given, uh, and uh, we will see that some surprises, uh, uh, so some kind 
surprising uh, uh, results that can be can be given in the case of probabilistic uh, probabilistic uh, calculi. And about metrics, we have to switch, as I already anticipated, to a different calculus, which is actually a linear one. Uh, this F stands for fuzz. Uh, so it's uh, a calculus which will uh, be kind of uh, uh, spelled out already for simple types, of course, types, and in the probabilistic case. And we will uh, show how notions of metrics can be, can be given. Uh, let's say in the second part, uh, when we talk about metrics, uh, we will try to be, uh, let's say, um, uh, less, uh, 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 we will go less into the details and we will rather uh, take a, a, a more bird's eye viewpoint on, uh, on what is going on, uh, just to highlight the, uh, the conceptual aspects rather than the mathematical details. And again, uh, if that permits, uh, we will talk about uh, uh, differentials uh, for the simple calculus at the end of the of this course. So um, the plan is to is for me to take uh, at least two lectures talking about equivalences. I hope not to use uh, more than that and to start with metrics already on Friday, so that uh, there is a little bit of time for differentials on Saturday. Um, so I will do my best. Uh, there will be no slides after this one. I prefer to use a whiteboard. I um, uh, use these slides, uh, like this kind of introductory uh, part of the course, uh, because otherwise, writing down all the examples would have taken forever. Uh, but once we delve into the mathematical side of the story, I think uh, using uh, uh, whiteboard is. Um, uh, is better, uh, pedagogically speaking. And uh, whiteboard transcripts uh, will be made uh, available at the Slack uh, or maybe even at the web page of the summer school. Um, I'm, I still haven't decided uh, where exactly to put all this material, but um, for sure it will be available at Slack. Uh, and uh, there is already an extensive set of lecture notes, uh, uh, which was uh, prepared mainly by Francesco Cavazzo. I, uh, or, uh, I again um, thank him for for help, um, which covers all of what we're going to say, and which is already available at the Slack. I um, apologize in advance because it has been written back in the last. Uh, Month and a half, so it is a pretty new and uh, uh, fresh set of lecture notes. So it, I'm sure it will contain they could they will contain a lot of typos and dangling references. But I think that like most uh, concepts are already spelled out in a decent way. And uh, if you want to let me know about uh, let us know about the uh, typos and. Uh, um, Missing uh, uh, or mistakes or uh, typing references or whatever, we would be very glad. And uh, yes, uh, so I think most questions have been already answered, but maybe there are questions about uh, this. Uh, this last part, the logistics and plan. If not, uh, there is uh, one more question now on yes. this plot, uh, chat. Uh, is parameter uh, parametricity uh, one kind of equivalence? For example, uh, here we on chat have a type for all a, uh, a to a. I would say that uh, parametricity is a is rather a way to derive equivalence between programs rather than an equivalence between a notion of equivalence between programs itself. Um, I say I think that uh, by parametricity you can again uh, conclude that many programs are are equivalent, and there are not that there are not so many uh, non-equivalent programs of a certain type, for example. Uh, but the underlying notion of equivalence is not given by parametricity itself, at least as far as I conceive parametricity. Up, up. Then you know. One may wonder whether uh, 
what it means really. Uh, for to me, parametricity is a technique to get uh, equivalence results rather than an equivalence, uh, uh, a notion of equivalence itself. But of course, other questions. Otherwise, I'm switch. I'm going to switch the uh, whiteboard, and I'm going to start. So maybe we can just uh, take. Uh, Two minutes break, a very, very quick uh, minutes break. So that just let me switch to the whiteboard. Okay. Just one second. Okay. Can you see the whiteboard? Uh, I can see blackboard and yeah, this. blackboard. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I should call it the black, uh, blackboard. Yes, I okay. prefer to use uh, black as the background color because I think it's less. Uh, you know, at least myself, I prefer because it's uh, uh, otherwise uh, after a while the white. Uh, Oh, you can see the whole screen. Oh, yes, uh, blackboard and. Uh, oh, I see. So I don't want to do it. Let me just. Uh, about this. Now you can see just the white, the blackboard, or. And uh, the upper. Uh, yeah, yeah, the upper, the upper, the upper stuff it needs to stay there. Yeah. But, but the, the only window uh, visible yes, is okay. the backboard. Wonderful. So, wonderful. Let's start. So, when we want to play with the program equivalence, what we want to do basically is to uh, is want to play with relations. Okay. So the basic object of study. Uh, the one of validation. So, and uh, I think uh, it's uh, well known, <laughs> and it's like the basic knowledge of all uh, um, EL uh, students uh, that validation is nothing between X and Y, it's a subset of the Cartesian program between X and Y. Okay, and uh, uh, as such, it is a set. So you can uh, compose the relation by taking union, intersection, all the set operations. Okay. But there's another way to compose relations, which is the one of uh, the given by a relation composition. So when you have uh, such an R, and but you also have an X, uh, which goes from Y to Z. Okay. You can say that you form uh, the Relation composition S R, sorry, R S. You first get R and then you get S. And this is defined by stipulating that X is in relation with Z, even though there exists a Y in the middle. 
such that uh, x r bar and y s z. Okay, so this is not just you know the set operation that you can for you can use on on relations. You can also go beyond that and have uh, some kind of operations typical of uh, relations, so, uh, which comes from the fact that uh, they are uh, relations are not just arbitrary sets, but they are subsets of the Cartesian program. There is one other observation, which is quite uh, uh, important and but very basic. So if you take a rel XY as uh, the set of all relations, uh, um, X and y. Well, you can give uh, this set the status of a uh, different is y. Because, well, there is a, a nice way of uh, defining an order relation on this set, which is just inclusion, right? And set inclusion is so well behaved with respect to the lattice structure. You can take a tiny union. Arbitrary intersections and everything works uh, quite well. Um, so this is nice because it, uh, it allows you to define uh, relations by taking the least and greatest uh, fixed point uh, due to the Nastasarsky theorem, uh, precisely because you get a complete matrix. And there is another uh, nice way to. Uh, define relations out of existing ones, which is uh, uh, so called uh, uh, relation transposition. So you can take the transpose of a relation R when let's say R is from X, Y, and is defined as uh, there is Y, X such that X, Y is in so you just reverse the uh, you just reverse the uh, the relation, if you like. And uh, but why do we care about doing all this? Well, uh, that is nothing fundamentally deep in what we are doing, but uh, it gives us a very nice notation and a very nice uh, language. For example, um, axioms that we often want to impose when we define notions of program equivalence or program order can be easily um, uh, spelled out as uh, inequalities okay, in this domain. So reflexivity, for example, uh, for a relations a relation in XX is what, say, R in uh, well, it is just well the fact that the identity relation is a subset of R. Right? Nothing more than that. Transitivity for um, R and S uh, uh, for that yeah, right. It is just well, what? The fact that when you compose R with itself, you get something which is in R. And uh, symmetry, out of any surprise, is nothing. R transpose. So that's the basic vocabulary that we will uh, that we will use. Uh, but we need to first of all spell it out uh, for programming language for program for programs for terms in a sort of programming language. Okay? Because there is not only there are not only like the the the, the kind of operations we have uh, described. So um, the, the relation 
composition, the relation transposition, etc. There are also relations and operations on relations which are typical kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, that comes from the fact that we want to define the relations uh, on terms, on programs. And so we need to set the ground for that. So we just take a, 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 an intermezzo, if you like. Which is what? Which is okay. The definition of the meta theory of a, of a language. And so we would define lambda as e. Actually, I will be quite quick here because I'm sure that for many of you, uh, this is just a um, routine. And on the other hand, again, this is something that Bob Arthur has already told you about last week. So um, I will be quick. On the other hand, if you have uh, questions, please ask. There is nothing uh, bad about asking questions, but let me let me be quite clear. So types, we take the types generated by booleans, unit, pairs, and arrows. Then there are uh, these are types. Then there are terms. But uh, terms will be kind of split into two. We will syntactically separate the values and computations. And let's first consider values. Values are as usual indicated with the W, and they are either variables or the uh, only value of type, uh, the closed value of type union through false uh, pairs of uh, values and also lambda abstractions. The body of the lambda abstraction, on the other hand, can be a computation. And uh, it is uh, either a computation that return a value. Uh, if then else, if V, then as f and uh, uh, you also have uh, uh, projections because uh, you work of course with uh, um, pairs and we have applications but applications are um, uh, only defined when the functions and the argument are values so this means that the language we are going to use uh, are so called fine, is fine grain. So it's, it's fine grain and cold grain. Uh, this has the advantage of making the, the meta theory like less bureaucratic, uh, even if um, nothing is lost in terms of expressive power. And uh, the, if you get the application in this particular form, it is, of course, clear that we need something more. So you get this here. Okay, wonderful. So this is like, uh, as I said, this is a uh, uh, defined grain called by value methodology. Uh, like uh, uh, there are like notions uh, that we don't want to talk about. Uh, uh, but we will use, of course, uh, substitutions. Uh. If I may interrupt, uh, we have yes. a question if uh, V in the conditional expression, if uh, conditions yes. should be a value? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So this is part of the, the so-called uh, um, uh, fine grain methodology. There is nothing particularly deep about uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, the guard of the if to be a computation. It's better in a sense to keep it a value because this way the, <laughs> say the, induct, the kind of inductions you, you always play with when you do theorems are slightly less uh, uh, cumbersome uh, and the notion of evaluation context is simpler. And uh, you can see it also from the definition of pairs, from the definition of projections 
in all these cases, uh, in all these cases, uh, there is a, a way to recover the old constructor. For example, I can tell you that if you want to write uh, this, uh, well, you can make, sorry, you can make it syntactically as let uh, x equal in x right? The same thing for Roger, the same thing for uh, is, it, is it okay? Uh, I think yes. so. And there is also an assertion uh, if uh, return just lifts values to computations. Absolutely. The return does nothing. It just uh, <laughs> turns a value into computation. Nothing strange. This is the, the advantage of, uh, um, this has the advantage uh, uh, of, uh, by the way, um, uh, allowing you to smoothly drift towards uh, effects, <laughs> at least the algebraic effects. Uh, in particular, when we will allow this language with uh, probabilistic choice, well, uh, it will be very, very, very simple to do it. And it will be absolutely no problems. And there's also a note about uh, that we have uh, not uh, computation type, but I think with typing rules we'll. Uh... Yeah, indeed, absolutely. There is no, uh, there is nothing like a computation type. Uh, we can keep the language of type uh, reasonably simple. Uh, on the other hand, you need, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a moment, uh, you need uh, uh, two portions of type, of type judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, the one for the one, uh, one, one for values and one for computation. So whenever you have uh, a computation as uh, typeable, you are implicitly putting, uh, uh, say, uh, something, a marker around the type, right? And uh, this mm -hmm. tells you that this is like a computation type, basically. But you don't need to do it explicitly. That's the point. You can do it kind of implicitly. And indeed, the next point is uh, to discuss is, uh, uh, I, was, I was telling you about uh, substitutions, but this is absolutely not uh, problematic, I would say. You can write, uh, write things like this. Uh, and these are nothing more. Substitution, so. Of course, capture a point. About typing, uh, let me uh, just uh, give you some of the rules, all the rules, uh, the typing rules. Uh, an environment, uh, first of all, is just a, uh, a partial function of variables. And uh, the kind of judgments uh, are of two kinds. So these are respectively judgment for values and And uh, typing rules, let's say examples of type of typing rules uh, are uh, maybe you can consider the next construct, which is uh, interesting because 
takes uh, a computation. Um, another computation. It gives you a computation loops. And well, the application uh, allows you to a computation out of the Okay. Do you have any request for other uh, other typing rules? I don't think there is anything deep going on here with respect to what you probably and hopefully already know. Um, and uh, just for the sake of uh, what is going on in the following, uh, it is quite uh, important, however, to fix, to fix the, some notations about the sets of uh, the values and the computation depending on the, the underlying time. Okay. So without giving the, uh, the like the actual definitions, we can form sets of computations as follows. These are respectively, say, open terms. This one. One and this is a close okay. So, open computations can be organized into set depending on the, on the type. That's what we are doing here, taking also into account. The environment, this is what we are doing here, or only restricting the closed computations, so computations which are typeable in the empty environment. If you want to do the same about the uh, values, uh, well, mm, there is nothing um, so deep. <laughs> you just uh, do exactly the same. And you get uh, uh, this, this, and this. But, so nothing. but it's important to, you know, to kind of fix the notation because we will play with these sets a lot. And uh, well. That's basically all about the static semantics. About the dynamic semantics, I just want to um, um, tell you something, which is uh, the fact uh, that uh, um, you can define uh, uh, the actual dynamic semantics, so the operational semantics, if you like, of uh, calculi. Uh, similar to this one uh, as follows. Uh, you can define it as uh, first by first of all keeping uh, um, uh, an n index uh, as well. You can define a map, which is actually not one single map of an index, but a family of maps which. Uh, Goes from what which treats uh, all possible set of closed uh, um, computations and uh, returns uh, the, the value. Actually, it's not a total function, it is a also partial function. And it is indexed by n. Uh, well, because uh, uh, you want to 
just uh, uh, consider computations in step indexed by a natural number. Okay? And this allows you to use the so called um, big step style. And uh, for example, um, this map is defined uh, uh, for, for the case uh, which uh, the argument, uh, the natural number argument is zero when it is defined uh, uh, as the, um, uh, it's defined as the bottom, right? It is undefined uh, because if you don't uh, uh, provide uh, uh, the function with an I, a not uh, natural number, well, it just uh, uh, returns uh, the, uh, just that doesn't return anything. It is undefined. On the other hand, if you have a return B and uh, you get a step index, which is high e, uh, enough, which is uh, uh, not uh, zero, well, uh, you just return uh, B because, uh, because you get enough too well for, uh, uh, for getting the actual value. And the fact that uh, it is uh, 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 it is not undefined, but it's like the, the actual um, uh, value of the function is often, often denoted with just, but it confuses uh, your ideas if you think about it as this one. And uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, the, can think about how to define the projection of course you want the fluid the the only interesting uh, uh, case uh, all the other ones are uh, really very simple is the one of the day. So in this case, well, you need to be a bit more careful. If you return F, the semantics of F, where B takes the place of X, indexed with a slightly smaller natural number, if the semantics of T on N is just T, and bottom of this. Okay. So the, uh, this way you can get an actual inductive definition without having to use uh, like derivation trees, etc. by just parametrizing uh, um, the, uh, the whole thing by a natural number. And, and another nice thing, which is and I think I'm going to finish soon, right? Because it's going to finish at nine, and uh, uh, a lot more, but uh, let me cover it a bit tomorrow. Uh, so the sequence of map, uh, the maps. Uh, All night question is an omega chain in the series of omega CDO of all partial functions going from uh, here. Yeah. So it means that there is an upper bound, right? And the upper bound is the actual dynamic semantics of this time. Okay. 
maybe I will interrupt again uh, yes. because we have some questions about indices yes, and subscripts. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's yeah. just write, write the definition. Discuss. Without a post. And that's an actual smart post. Just uh, okay. So uh, we have uh, just a few minutes, but let, uh, let's go to questions. Uh, maybe let's start with uh, N. N stands for step indexing, right? Yes, should be, yes. Uh, it's a way, if you like, to make the overall definition of the dynamic semantics uh, um, inductive, right? You don't, if you look at what happens here, you have a purely inductive definition. While uh, if you give the big step semantics in terms of like uh, uh, derivation trees, for example, well, you need to fix uh, 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 a notion of derivation tree, right? And that is the, 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 in the induction you work with. While here you work with the induction of natural numbers. And this is quite the same. DC and uh, natural and uh, uh, it, again, uh, we have decided to go this way because this leads so well to all kinds of possible variations of the titles, uh, in particular those with uh, effects. But yes, the answer is that's just step indexing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we have uh, two more and maybe they are connected because uh, yes. one is about uh, big pi sub sigma in the type. Yes. And the second is uh, subscript epsilon. Is... Okay. So uh, I think uh, well, the first question the refers to this one here. And this is just the, uh, the product. You know, you just uh, uh, take uh, uh, the um, uh, product. Uh, uh, the Cartesian product of all possible sets in the form uh, lambda sigma. So this function, if you take a look at it, it's not indexed by types. There is just one, uh, one such function. Okay. And that's, uh, that's it. You want just one function and you don't want to care about the um, uh, actual, uh, uh, the actual type. Uh, you want to, to define it once and for all. Maybe that's this way, otherwise, of course, it doesn't make sense. Maybe that was one of the uh, reasons for the misunderstanding. And the other question was about what I don't know. Uh, epsilon subscript. Ah, there is nothing deep about it. It's just a, it's just, I mean, a weight underlined that we are talking about computations, but the, to distinguish it with, from other notions of semantics. There is nothing deep about it. We could well have uh, uh, just omitted uh, this uh, and uh, that, that would be nothing wrong. It's just a way to distinguish uh, this notion of uh, operational semantics with, other, with respect to other ones. Uh, I'm sorry for the, for the parochism, but... Uh, <laughs> Other questions. For example, here I just noticed that I forgot those things. Uh, I know so. this epsilon has nothing to do with the epsilon <laughs> in the slides. <laughs> I'm best. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it is an operational semantics. Absolutely. It is. It is formulated with this kind of strange brackets of a mini set of something else, namely the denotation as numbers. But is an operation. It is a way to inductively define the big step semantics without having any need for trees or 